Could you please rise? An invocation from Romans 6. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The word of the Lord. We gather to mourn the loss and to celebrate the victory of the life of Phyllis Benjamin. Please be seated. Revelations 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a beautiful bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself 
will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. This is from 8, uh, John 8, 12. This was Phyllis's confirmation verse. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 14, 1 through 6. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how, you don't know where we're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Lord except through me. This is some of Phyllis's extra Sam's Club supplies. <laughs> uh, and I'm bringing this out. I might get emotional. <laughs> and I might need some her supplies. Anyways, uh, Phyllis lived by herself for the last 23 years. I tried to convince her that you don't need the Sam's Club membership, you live by yourself. Especially, she would get the 72 rolls of toilet paper, she would get the 18 rolls of, of, uh, of uh, paper towels. But uh, she would say to me, you know, Tom, and I think it's because when I grew up in a family of age, she goes, you can't beat those prices, at, at those bulk prices we have. And your sister Karen and I like the roasted chicken when we leave, so we have that when we get home after going shopping. So. Uh, welcome everybody to the church. Uh, Grace Luther Church, celebrate our mom, Phyllis Benjamin. My name is Todd. Um, I'm not the, I am the eldest living son, but that's not why I'm up here to talk. I'm up here to talk because my mom took meticulous notes over the last 23 years of how today was going to unfold. And so, she said, Todd, you're going to speak. And here's where, here, here's where it gets stuff. And then she added this the last six months. She did this a lot to Karen and I. She added a lot of notes at the end of her life. And she goes, God's going to speak. And then she added underneath that this year. And it'll be a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Really. <laughs> it's like, okay, we'll, we'll see what we can do. 
Uh, my daughters have an over under on this speech of mine because uh, I used to be their swim coach, and sometimes at the year in banquets I might go a little bit. So I'm going to try to make sure I don't go over their expected length of this thing. Uh, this place was very, this church was special to my mom. Um, not specifically the building, but the church of originally was First Lutheran. Um, she uh, was a member her entire life to this church. Uh, she was baptized, confirmed, married here uh, in this church. Um, all six of us kids were baptized here. Uh, we were also, all six of us were confirmed, and three of my siblings were married here. Uh, Pastor Angie will talk a little bit about my mom's involvement with the church a little bit later. Uh, the church moved to this location in 1959, which is the same year I was born. And, uh, Let's see where we're right here. <laughs> oh, and so uh, my mom was proud of the fact, if Mrs. Davis is here, uh, Kate and Davis and I were the first two uh, babies baptized from this location. Um, and so my mom took great pride in that. And I know you're right now, you're thinking to yourself, gosh, 1959, this church has held up pretty well. Todd, man. <laughs> Mom, my mom was ahead of her time, so we hear these phrases nowadays that are kind of popular, like homegirl. That was based on Phyllis. So Phyllis lived 90 years within two blocks of her same location where she was raised and grew up, and where she raised us and grew up. And she was super proud of that. And uh, she graduated from White Bear High School, as did all of us kids. Um, she was actively involved in the White Bear Beach Community Club. Uh, for a period of time, she managed fire permitting. So back when we were kids, there weren't the housing developments up in the north end of White Bear. So you had to get a permit, you could burn big burns. So my mom managed that for a while. Um, she was uh, the neighborhood merchant carrier kids. So a lot of injuries that occur when you're on planning, they would go to my mom. And uh, she has super lifelong good friends, Mike and Ginger, Ken, Sandy, and Sharon. Uh, they, they all lived together in that community for, that, for a very long period of time. Uh, while we were growing up, we had a lot of latitude to run the neighborhood. We were right off White Bear Lake. And so once we could swim without a life jacket, we could go wherever we want, do whatever we want. Um, and so, however, a couple times a day, my mom would pull up. Dad's police was sheriff's department whistle. She'd be on the back step and we heard that whistle. You had to be home like within five or six minutes or there was going to be an issue. So, so that was uh, um, kind of the, 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 how the neighborhood worked back then. Um, she, mom learned how to make meals for eight. And so when I think about that, Karen and I were talking about this, it probably tipped the scales towards quantity versus quality. But back then, we didn't go out to eat, so you had no reference points. Everything was really a grand meal. Um, and she was very creative putting these meals together. Um, we had a, this is true, we had a, literally we had a picnic table in our kitchen in order to fit all of us ate at the thing. And uh, it was just, um, just a very fun experience. And we were, well, we had five boys, so we were well fed. And I'm sure their budget was, was out of the world. But uh, the one thing that I, I've learned over time, especially after I went away, is there's a lot better food out there than what we might have grown up on. Especially one thing is never allowed in our house is beef roll-ups with pea sauce over the top. I don't actually know if that's a real thing, but for us, of course. But we did learn, one thing we did really love, though, we loved my mom, my dad's mom, they were, my dad's family was from the UP, and my grandma taught mom how to make pasties. And at least once a year, we'd have homemade pasties to die for. They were awesome. So there were eight of us. We lived in a 1,500 square foot ramp, but with one bath. Believe it, this, this day and age, that'd be unheard of, you know. And so we made it work. Um, on special occasions or holidays, mom would often dress us in coordinated outfits with the uh, with our home style haircut, especially there's a lot of pictures of Lee, Graham, and I. We were always in these designer type outfits um, when we were, we were little, you know, and so I don't know, that just was a fun thing to do back then. A favorite day of the year for us, at least for Lee, Graham, and I, was uh, school would end the very next day. This happened every year of the summer. The first day of summer, my mom would line us up on the patio, which is before she had the porch with the wall hair cutters and shave our heads. And 
It was literally the best day of the year. Um, probably not style-wise, however, we knew what that meant was freedom for the whole summer. Either we were down at the lake, playing ball, whatever, um, until we heard the whistle. And so that was just a great memory. Now, it probably was less of a good memory for my brother Grant, because it was always done in chron chronological order of birth, so that old metal ball clipper, by the time we my brother's head, it was steaming hot. So Grant would always be whining. You know, he he was, you know, like four years, five, four years younger than me and five years younger than me. So he would just be squirming and whining. By that time Lee and I were already swimming at the lake. So. Uh, being connected to groups and people was a big part of my mom's life, and that's why a lot of you are here today. Um, uh, she participated in bowling leagues, had White Bear Bowl, Wildwood Bowl, Sunray Bowl. She participated in White Bear White Bear Lake PTA, worked at the Ramsey County Sheriff's Department Auxiliary, uh, organized cousin lunches, mall walking, crew, Red Hat Society. She took multiple trips with traveling friends after my dad passed away. Um, and while growing up, uh, my mom hosted, uh, this was a thing back in the 60s, she made, my mom and dad had several uh, house parties in the basement. And so we had this really cool bar. I think Larry might be here today. He did the mural on the bar that my parents had in the basement. And, uh, and they had this hi-fi system, not Wi-Fi, but hi-fi. And then it had a, a phonograph that went with it. And then, uh, so they host these really fun uh, events for adults. Now, Lee Grant and I, we were little. So we were always relegated to the bedroom upstairs. We had this TV on wheels. They'd roll it in there. My mom would give us a bag of potato chips and some homemade chip dip made of ketchup or something. And, well, it was awesome. <laughs> we thought this was the greatest thing ever. But we could never go downstairs during that party, so I'm not sure exactly what was going on. Well, I think I knew what was going on. Um, those were really good times for us. My mom hosted many events and picnics, holiday gatherings. Um, every year we took a driving vacation. Um, and so we went across the country uh, tenting and then eventually with a camper. And uh, um, today my mom would be, her title would be like a supply chain manager or logistics manager because to do that with a family of eight, especially when we were tenting, it was crazy to put all the supplies in the and where we were going across the country. Every summer, two weeks, we hit the road. Magical, good times. Um, mom, during those times, Mom helped us uh, teach us how to play cribbage, which is passed on through my father's side of the family, which is now passed on to multiple generations within our family. One of those trips, we were on the way home, and I know, I know Lee and Grant remember this, we, we were running out of food, and I'm sure the, 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 the cash flow was probably drying up by the end of that trip. And so we stopped, and, and, and we threw lunch, and uh, this was, of course, before fast food. We wouldn't be able to afford that anyway. But my mom says, hey, did you guys hear about the latest, greatest sandwiches that people are having? And we're like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, it's pickles and mustard on bread. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. <laughs> so we, I know, we ate those things like crazy. <laughs> so today, when you, after service, we do have pickles, mustard, and bread, but we also have turkey, ham, cheese, and everything else that comes along with it. So uh, this is all what Phil has suggested, actually requested and requires us to have for her today. Um, so in, throughout nine years, the food changes, you know, food trends have changed. And so one of the things my mom never grasped was pasta salad. And she loves pasta salad, so we're having that today, which she requested. But she would always say, pasta. So when you're having your pasta salad today, just think of Phyllis, she's so happy you're eating her pasta. <laughs> uh, last summer, Phyllis moved into St. Andrews Village. Uh, so after 90 years living on the north end of White Bear Lake, which is in Ramsey County, White Bear Township, um, she was moving to the south side. Well, Carolyn, our family, lived on the south side. My dad grew up on the south side, so for me it wasn't a big deal. For mom, it was like primary a crowbar out of that house. And so she transitioned over there because now she's living in Washington County in Matamita. That's like the wrong side of the lake. I mean, that's just, for white bear people, that's like crazy. Within two or three days, my mom was so connected to St. Andrews Village because half the population was from First Lutheran. So she was like meeting up with all of her friends, met new friends. There's not one event over there that she missed in the four years that she lived over there. Um, and so uh, 
One summer, Karen remembers this vividly, they were hosting, this was a couple summers ago, the Summer Olympics. So St. Andrew's Village Regiment Summer Olympics, so they have, of course, modified uh, events. And Mom got up, she wasn't feeling that good that day, and so, but she needed to go down there and participate. Didn't want to miss out. So later that afternoon, she called my sister Karen and says, you know, I'm not feeling good. I, I, I was active this morning, but I've been in bed all afternoon. I'm not sure what's going on. So Karen went over there. Lo and behold, we end up that afternoon. Mom gets admitted to the hospital. Um, so she had another episode with her, with her cardiac stuff going on. And uh, so she did get admitted to the hospital that night, stayed for a while, but she was wearing her gold medal for the longest uh, uh, watermelon spitting contest in the city. <laughs> she was very proud of that. That medal was still hanging. She put that in the box to hang out here so you could see it. We did have some fun. So even at the end, we had, there was time to love me. So my mom was articulate, she was sharp. I mean, so that was a blessing to us, I'll be honest with you. So Karen and I, the last maybe year, year and a half, we spent countless number of hours with my mom in various waiting rooms, rooms, transition rooms, hospital rooms, assisted living, independent living. Karen slept on the floor for a week. And my mom was still always sharp. But one of the things that she had, she, she would say, when you get to the hospital or transition care, you sit for a while. She goes, you know what this reminds me of? She goes, this is like the military. Hurry up and wait. It's kind of the thing my dad used to say. So a lot of times my mom was nervous, but she just loved having it being there because she had Karen and I captive. She knew we weren't going anywhere. So we were there for hours. She wouldn't stop talking. So occasionally we'd have to say, Mom, you need to sit there and they want you to rest, not visit, or we're going to leave. And every time we'd say we're going to leave, she'd go, oh, you're kidding. You know, this is the kind of way she would do that to keep engaging with us. Um, so the one time we're in there, and this is an elongated waiting session. So I'm, having, I'm getting a little giddy. So I start to walk out and I turn back to Mom. And my sister sitting next to her Mom holding her hand and said, God, Mom, what does this remind you of? She goes, oh, why don't you the military? Hurry up and wait. <laughs> Karen had this death look at me. So I just walked out, took a little break. Um, my last transport with my mom, uh, we're in the lobby filling out paperwork. And, and so my mom had some uh, writing, she had some challenges being able to do things. So I'm, I have the clipboard, I'm reading her the questions. And, and so this was uh, a, a follow up from last fall and so she had multiple different appointments so she goes hard for her to keep them straight I can understand that so I said mom this is the appointment we're going to deal with it's about your broken clavicle which is your collarbone and it's about with the ortho to check out you know how that's coming along she's okay I got it so first question um, describe your pain one through ten she responded well my shoulder pain is a seven I said, well, okay, Mom, they didn't technically do anything with your shoulder, so they're asking about your clavicle, but it probably resonates out there, but when we talk to the doctor, it's about your clav broken clavicle. She says, okay, next question. If you could explain your, your uh, pain, would it be, on, if it's on one to seven, would it be constant stabbing, throbbing, numbing, or dull? Well, she said, well, if you're asking about my clavicle, it's nothing. But if you're asking about my shoulder, it's stabbing. <laughs> I laid a clipboard down. I said, are you seriously testing me right now? Because I'm going to drive out of here, and you have no way to get home. She goes, oh, you're just kidding. <laughs> I'd love to have one more. Transport. I have two housekeeping notes from my mom that passed on. After my dad's funeral in 1999, I, we put some thoughts together on paper about my dad and we shared it with our family. We were, we were just too caught off guard when my father passed away, so we weren't in any shape to be able to talk to his funeral. Um, so mom had that in her funeral planning folder. <laughs> and so we made copies of it. She also had two other flyers that she had meant a lot to her, so that's out there for people to take if you'd like. The other piece of housekeeping is, um, the, when we get, uh, hope you'll join us for lunch afterwards, um, my mom had a, uh, she's from the generation that collected uh, bone china cups and saucers, 
and she must have had a bazillion because she's already, while she was alive, distributed many to her uh, uh, her kids, her uh, nieces, nephews, grandkids, great grandkids, and so. Um, when you're going through things, there's still about another 20 or so left in the things. And so we have them out there. They have the creamers on the tables. Um, she would like to have, if you're a friend of hers or a relative or um, a, a, a close person, certainly please take one in remembrance of my mom. And uh, you, you can hold on to that. So, thank you. How did it? Would you please rise as we join in singing together the hymn, How Great Thou Art, the words are found.
Phyllis Benjamin, loving wife, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and sister. Phyllis was born April 29, 1928, to Carl and Alice Olson. She was baptized on July 15, 1928, and confirmed her faith in Christ at First Lutheran Church on Stewart Avenue in White Bear on May 30, 1943. Phyllis attended White Bear Beach School for grades 1 through 8 and then graduated from White Bear High School in 1945. After high school graduation, Phyllis worked for the State Department of Education from 1945 to 1950. Phyllis married Stillwell, Ben, Benjamin, October 9, 1948 at First Lutheran White Bear Lake, and they built their home in White Bear Beach and raised six children, Dan, Karen, Murray, Todd, Lee, and Grant. In 1968, Phyllis went to work at White Bear High School in the library, where she worked for 10 years and then moved into the role of Secretary of Special Ed Services at the White Bear Lake School District offices for 10 years. She retired in 1988. Phyllis and her husband traveled during retirement. After Ben's death in 1999, Phyllis continued living in their home until moving to St. Andrews Village in 2019. At First Lutheran, now Community of Grace, Phyllis served in many ministry capacities over the years, with women's ministry as treasurer of the LCW for six years, as circle chairman with Naomi Circle for many years as well. She volunteered her time serving the church office by helping assemble the monthly newsletter for over 20 years. With hospitality ministry, she served as a Sunday morning greeter and baked welcome bread for Sunday morning visitors. With the Ministry of Fellowship and Service, she served at funerals and Wednesday night soup suppers and knit lap robes for homebound members. In the greater community, over the years, Phyllis served as the Secretary and Treasurer of the PTA and the White Bear Beach Community Club. Phyllis was a member of the Red Hat Society and took many trips with three dear friends, her daughter and her son and daughter-in-law. She was in Boston when 9-11 happened traveling to destinations such as Seattle, Hawaii two times, and Alaska two times. Phyllis is survived by four children, 14 grandchildren, and 17 great-grandchildren. We gather today to remember and commend to her Savior the life of Phyllis Benjamin. And Phyllis was a warm woman of faith with a beautiful zest for life, a lively smile, and a cheerful heart. Phyllis loved Jesus. She loved people and she loved to have fun. Her family jokingly called her the ambassador because they knew whenever they went out to eat, by the time they left the restaurant, they would have met all the people at all the neighboring tables. <laughs> Phyllis was outgoing, loving, bold. She was independent and strong, but deeply relational. And the people and things that were important to Phyllis, she took very seriously, her family, her friends, her faith. But she could find humor in anything. That sparkle in her eye, the humor always in love she brought into any situation made her a welcoming presence to others and an inspiring example of a life lived in and by grace. And as you heard in Todd's memories, you can imagine how she needed that sense of humor managing a household of eight. Phyllis loved to encourage people, but she was nobody's doormat. Phyllis had amazingly good boundaries. She knew what was hers to do and what was not. And when others tried to guilt her into taking on things outside of her responsibilities or push her towards something she didn't want, she would gently but firmly hold her ground, without anger, but also without apology. Because Phyllis just simply knew her value. She knew the value of her time, of her mind, of herself. To her core, she knew she had nothing to prove regarding her worth. That had been made secure by the work of Jesus for her sake. And so Phyllis chose to live showing kindness, dignity, and respect, both to herself as one Jesus loved and died for, and also to others, knowing Jesus loved for them as well. And that faith also made her incredibly forgiving. Even when she was truly hurt, Phyllis chose quickly to forgive as she herself had been forgiven. And she found in following Jesus in this, it opened up her life to the lightness of his grace. And if you knew Phyllis, it might not surprise you that the details of the service were all planned out at a time by her. She wanted to make sure that you heard the promises of Jesus' grace that held and formed her her whole life long. 
And one of the verses that she selected for today, her confirmation verse, she actually wrote out word for word in several places in her notes, obviously from memory, as a word held close to her heart for decades. And it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It was May 1943 when Phyllis publicly confessed that she was trusting Jesus for that promise in her confirmation. And through all the years I've known her, I can say I believe she truly did seek to trust him with every step. And I saw that light of Jesus' life in her. And that's not to say her path was always easy or that it never felt dark. I saw Phyllis walk many hard paths and struggle through dark times. But through them all, I found myself amazed by the light of her faith, her resilient spirit, and her renewed love for life that always managed to shine through every challenge. And two of Phyllis's favorite psalms, Psalm 121 and Psalm 39, reflect where she found that strength. Psalm 121 says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. And Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. What a blessing it is to know and to trust that there is no place the Lord can't find us. Even when we feel lost in the darkness, even when we feel we can't see Him, we can trust He sees us. He is with us. And that he sees the way forward, even if we don't. And not only does he see it, but he will lead us into it with his hand in ours. We can trust in what Jesus sees, even when we do not see. And this is how his light becomes the light of our hope through the very real darkness of our lives. When we walk in trust, we walk in the light. And his light shines through us into a dark world that needs to know the light of his love for them as well. And through every twist and turn of her life's path, Phyllis did seek to walk with Jesus. From the very beginning of her life, this was her church family. And it was with this church community that she came to know Jesus, leaning into the baptismal promise that held her, confirming her faith in Jesus' gift of saving grace for her. She came to know the Lord as the source of all good things in this wondrous world, and she wanted to experience it all. In her later high school years, Phyllis met Ben while playing piano for his cousin's wedding. And Ben, who was a few years older, quickly came to realize she was the girl for him. And he wanted to marry her, but Phyllis didn't want to get married right out of high school. So she told him, I'm not ready for that. I want to live a little first. And she did. After high school, while she and Ben continued to date, Phyllis got to travel with her good friend Ruth to Pikes Peak and Colorado and New York, taking her first airplane ride, exploring more of the world. She had an adventurous spirit and a zest for life that Ben admired. And then one day when Ben invited her over for a full roast beef dinner cooked by him, after sitting on the porch and talking a while, eventually Phyllis admitted, I don't think I'd mind putting my name on your mailbox. <laughs> and the rest was history. He had to work for it, but she was worth it. They met in 1945, they married in 1948 at First Lutheran, and they entered into the adventure of following the Lord together in family life, and they were a good team right from the start. Phyllis helped hand dig their well, and helped in building their first home, a one-room bedroom cabin on the north end of White Bear Lake, before eventually building the big house on the same property. And when Ben was drafted to serve in the military, Phyllis moved in with Ben's parents during his time of service. Phyllis was always grateful that for both of Ben's stints in the service, he was placed stateside rather than overseas, because both of them had so many friends who had not returned home. And when his service was done, together they dedicated their lives to the raising of their six kids. And growing in faith was a big part of their life together. 
There was never a Sunday when the family wasn't in worship, even when the car wouldn't start and all eight of them had to squeeze into the pickup truck to get here. The Faith family was a big part of their community, proven when, much to the kids' dismay, Phyllis and Ben would stay 45 minutes after church every week talking to everyone. They saw the church community grow from its fledgling roots on Stewart Avenue and then took the leap with the church in building this location. And through Sunday school and VBS and confirmation and hope anew, Phyllis walked with her kids through each step of growing faith. And Ben made sure during the Ludafis suppers that all the Benjamin men were put to work in the kitchen, helping to pull off the feast in fine style. And when Phyllis went to work as for the school as a librarian, she had the summers available for the kids. And as you heard a little bit about that, since Phyllis grew up in that neighborhood, she knew if anyone misbehaved, she would hear about it. So she could just send the kids off to play. And those summers were glorious, spending time on the lake together. But even more special were those, those yearly two-week vacation trips you've heard about, where Phyllis and Ben would teach by example what a beautiful gift it was to experience new and different parts of the world. Those trips opened up possibilities and curiosity and wonder for them, which echoed Phyllis's own heart. In simple ways, Phyllis and Ben taught by example what it is to live by joy and grace in relationship with God and the world and each other. And that continued with the next generation. When Karen lost her first husband, she decided to take her girls camping at Gooseberry Falls and it rained a lot. And by the morning, everything was waterlogged, including them. But while they were attempting to cook some soggy breakfast, they looked up to see Phyllis and Ben driving up in their conversion van, saying, we just thought we'd join you. And incidentally, would you like to take a trip into two harbors to the laundromat to dry everything you own? <laughs> and reset the campsite? And have a meal somewhere else? They stayed that night, and when the rains came again, they helped shelter them with the van, and the next day they decided they all had enough of camping and headed home. That's how Phyllis loved. She showed up, generously, practically, lovingly, without fanfare, meeting needs without even having to be asked. She and Ben were a very good team in that, and when Ben died, it died so unexpectedly, it truly devastated. And even though she trusted Jesus, her path was so dark, she very much needed the faith of those around her to help feel his love with her. And Phyllis wrote about that time. She said, The Lord tested my faith when I lost my dear husband and life companion. There were such great witnesses of faith through my family and my church family. The members of Naomi's circle and pastors, they all poured out their love and sympathy. This all helped steady my faith. My life in the church gave me the wisdom to understand prayer. And if I doubt, to steady my faith. And if I'm tempted, to make me strong to resist. If I miss the mark, to give me the courage to try again. Lord, grant me wisdom by which I may understand the answers to my prayers. Through this dark time of grief, Phyllis leaned on her faith family. She leaned on those she could see until she could feel again Jesus' presence walking with her, until she could see the light of his light on her path again. Eight months after Ben's passing, Phyllis ended up taking the anniversary trip she had planned with her daughter Karen. They made beautiful memories she treasured. And in this new season of her life, the independence that was always part of her spirit led her into many new paths of serving with churches, women's ministry, and senior events, and trips, and learning opportunities with new friends and old. And when I first met Phyllis, she had just celebrated her 80th birthday. And coming here to this church, I experienced from her the warm welcome of the ambassador. And I knew right away this was a woman I wanted to know. And although in the years that followed, she walked through back surgery, joking how her brace made her feel like a turtle, and the trauma of almost losing Lee, through different seasons of health issues and hospital stays and recovery, her beautiful, resilient spirit remained. And it was only after Phyllis turned 90 that it was clear things needed to change. The winters had kept her more homebound, and steep stairs kept her from the laundry in the basement. And for a person as independent and social as Phyllis, those changes were hard. And then a few months after she turned 90, she lost her oldest son. And grief took a heavy toll on her. And within 30 days of Dan's passing, she had a stroke. And although her swift recovery was a true blessing thanks to wonderful neighbors, 
It became clear it was time to consider a new setting. And as it turned out, as you heard, St. Andrew's Village became a wonderful blessing in her life. Many of her friends lived there, and she made many more of workers and residents alike. In her apartment, she continued to cook for herself, to bake, to do her laundry, to choose when she'd share meals with others, and she went to every class and event and trip she could fit in her schedule. She made the most of this new beginning, and feeling blessed to be there, she was, as she always was here, a blessing to all who knew her. Through the ups and downs of her aging, Phyllis kept her resilient joy. And then, this past January, once again, it was the unexpected loss of family that deeply impacted Phyllis in both body and spirit. In a short time, she lost several family members, her childhood best friend, and her son, Marie. No one should ever have to know the grief of losing a child. Phyllis lost, too. She got to the point of dreading the ringing of the phone because she was heartsick to think of yet another loss. And after this last fall, when she was preparing to move back to St. Andrews, she decided it was time for assisted living. But the relationships she had formed were so important to her at St. Andrews that the first day back out of the recovery center, the first thing she did was push her call buttons and say, I need to go downstairs to join my friends for the breakfast group. It was the last time she was able to see them, but because she felt she could, she did. But as the days went by, it became more and more clear that her indomitable spirit, body, and soul were preparing to let go of her hold on this world, preparing to be embraced instead by the strength and love of her Savior's hold on her. In her last week, Phyllis saw Ben everywhere, patiently waiting for her to say all her goodbyes and come home. One of the scriptures Phyllis chose for today are Jesus' words from John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, what I've told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may know where you also may be where I am. And Phyllis knew and trusted that as Jesus had walked with her all through life, he would also be faithful to walk with her from this life into the resurrection life that his grace had won for her. When she needed his rescue, when the storms of this life came to be too much for her, she knew he would show his love by showing up, that he would be there by her side to bring her safely home. When Jesus said, you know the way to the place I'm going, Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And just as in Phyllis' confirmation verse, Jesus assures us, we don't have to know the way, we don't have to be the light, because he himself is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him, but through him, all can come to the Father. Jesus is the light, and those who follow him never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And what a life it is. The final text Phyllis selected for today is from Revelation 21, which reminds us, in the end, all that remains is the glory of Jesus' faithfulness and the beauty of being his. In the end, he alone will walk us into the new heaven and the new earth. God's dwelling place will be among his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Jesus came to be the true ambassador. He is the one who, in reaching out to us through the cross, connects us to an eternal friendship with God forever by his own reconciling gift of grace. In his kingdom, sorrow is left behind in the joyful reunions of sinner saints past, present, and future, all redeemed by Jesus' grace alone. So today, we can truly rejoice for Phyllis. I believe she knows a freedom today and a brand new adventure of wonder and love that's greater than we can imagine. And I believe that her desire for you today would be that you too would know the hope that the promise of Jesus gives, not just for this hope of life everlasting someday with him, but the hope of his love every moment of every day to help you navigate the real sorrow and the real darkness of this broken world. 
May you also know when you feel lost in the darkness, that even when you can't see him, he sees you, and he will lead you forward as you trust in him. May the witness of Phyllis's beautiful faith help us see that the light of Jesus is here for us on our own paths, knowing when we walk in trust, we walk in the light, and his light shines through us in the dark world. So until the day you see Phyllis again in his kingdom of light, may you too find life in following the one who is the light of this world and of the next. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Would you please rise and join me? Lord God, in grief we hardly know how to pray, but we know that in all times, and especially in this time, that you are right here with us. So we ask you, Lord, to hear the cries of our hearts and fill the needs we can't express, which you alone know and understand. Lord, you sent your Son, Jesus, to bring us life. And we give you thanks that by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death, and by his resurrection, opened the kingdom of heaven to all who believe. And make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also. And neither life, nor death, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, give all who mourn a sure confidence in your loving care, that each heart may know the peace of your love, which passes all understanding. Give courage, faith, and strength to meet the days ahead in the joyful expectation of the new life we will share with Phyllis in your kingdom. And help us, we pray, in the midst of things we don't understand, to trust in the power and truth of your promise, and there to find our peace. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now our Lord's Prayer will be prayed over us through song.
into your hands, our merciful Savior. We commend your servant to fill us. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, your everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As the family recesses during the postlude, the congregation is invited to follow one row at a time from the front of the sanctuary to the back as we follow the pallbearers with the family recession. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ. <laughs>